This is for debate nine. I'm going to go in and go a little closer. This is extra. This is the extra debate that's in class. No end in sight, violence in Ciudad Juarez. Juarez, I'm sorry. And then here is the close up of that. And this is by Howard Campbell. Ciudad Juarez in the Mexican state or Chihuahua is known as a city of death, perhaps the most violent place in the planet on the planet. It is home to the world's highest homicide rate. Officially there were 3,111 total murders in 2010, but since many deaths go unreported, the real number is likely significantly higher. Like many other Mexican border cities, Juarez has had a relatively high levels of crime. Vice and uh, corruption for decades, but it is it was not always as brutally violent as it is today. Not long ago, the city was renowned for or renowned by its own inhabitants, the Warrenes. This is visitors <clears throat> from its sisters sister city across the border, El Paso, Texas, and millions of migrants for its fine weather, vibrant nightlife, and relatively high standard of living. In the mid-1980s, two powerful drug traffickers, Rafael Aguilar Cuiardo, a federal police commander, and Rafael Munez Tal Talavera, a businessman, ran the Juarez cartel. But the city's earth yearly homicides remained below 100 until 1993. That year, Armando Carrillo Fuentes muscled out his competitors and took control of the Juarez trafficking market and assumed the mantle of the Juarez Canal from 1993 onward. Armando Amado Carnilla Fuentes, an innovator in jet transporting cocaine from South America to Northern Mexico, substantially increased the volume of cross-border drug trafficking homicides, including a substantial number of killings of women that were labeled fem femicides, increased correspondingly in 1993. Homicides total, total surpassed 100 for the first time in recent history. And from 1994 on, to on total homicides surpassed the 200 mark and remained there for the rest of the decade. Where the single exception of 1999, when they decline in the aftermath of the Correo Fuentes death and the violent shakeup within the cartel that occurred immediately after it. By 2000, Vincent Correo Fuentes, Amando's brother, re regained control of tra the trafficking market and the homicide rates leveled off at about 200 to 300 a year as business returned to normal. Drug trafficking continued to produce needed revenue for thousands of Warrenneses and El Pasoans, locally known as the Pasanos. Many border people considered the violence inevitably produced by the drug trade to undesirable, but not out of control. Although activi activists, relatives, and friends protested the disappearances and murders of their loved ones. Indeed, despite the increase in killings and disappearances that began in the 1990s, Juarez remained a bustling 24-7 city that was much livelier than El Paso. The ultraviolence that Juarez now endures began in 2008 with the drug trafficking arrest in El Paso of high-ranking Juarez police official Salo Reyes Gamboya, who reputed, reput, reputedly cooperated with U.S. law enforcement. Then a series of high-profile killings occurred in rapid succession in Juarez. Knowledgeable local observers attributed these deaths to attempts to, by the Juarez cartel to kill disloyal members as well as to in, internal power struggles. 
within the organization after the downfall out of a once powerful leader. This internal battle was exploited by the cartel's bitter rival, the Sianola cartel, led by Chapo Guzman, in an attempt to take over the Juarez drug trafficking market. As the violence continued, experts compared the Juarez drug war to, to the 2004-2006 Intel cartel squabble between the Gulf cartel Zetas and the Sianola cartel for control of the Nueva, Laredo, and surrounding areas. By March of 2008, the spike in Juarez violence attracted the attention of Mexican President Felipe Galdron, who sent thousands of soldiers and federal police into the city streets to stop the bloodshed. Military and police checkpoints, heavily loaded troop transport trucks with, filled with federal cops in heavy body armor and ski masks. With their fingers on the trigger of automatic weapons became ambiguous sites on the border town. Whereas in a state of siege, essentially controlled by the military, in the first month of the surge, the homicide rate dipped, but it quickly returned to high levels that have only since increased. <clears throat> in 2008, <clears throat> excuse me, there were about 1,600 homicides, more than 2,700 in 2009 more than 30,100 in 2010, and rates continue uh, space as of June. While figures are often unobtainable or open to interpretation, in many cases, the magnitude of the tragedy is beyond question. Social critics, <clears throat> activists, and victims, relatives assert that much of the violence is in fact perpetrated by these same soldiers and policemen who also engage in financial violence within their own ranks with municipal cops killing other municipal cops and city and federal police engaging in shootouts with each other throughout the federal and local government cl claimed to be reforming the police force. The municipal force police were purged several times police captains were replaced and federal police were rotated back and forth. The military was reinforced, then partially withdrawn, then back, brought back. The federal police took over from the military and military forces were reduced substantially. The federal police proved to be so abusive, however, that many warriors now call for the complete withdrawal of both it and the army. Violence and criminality, particularly the booming extortion and kidnapping businesses actually grew <clears throat> with the arrival of the soldiers and federal police. At the same time, the Aztecas and other lesser of or rival criminal gangs multiplied as the city devolved into a totally new lawless nightmare, a war ravaged landscape of burned out and abandoned buildings by day, a ghost town by night, reportedly more than 100,000 homes lie vacant, abandoned or destroyed. Perhaps as many as 20% of Juarez's previous inhabitants have fled the violence for El Paso or other destinations in the United States and Mexico. Since 2008, there have been only a few days in which there were no killings in Juarez. These few relatively peaceful days were primarily the result of extreme, extremely cold weather, winter weather, which forced residents to stay in their homes. Many of the victims of recent violence are not big-time cartel members. They are street-level drug dealers, small-time gangsters, small business people of all sorts who refuse to pay exhortive protection fees. By standards, by standards, municipal policemen and women, hapless smugglers who lost their drugs lo lo drug loads, snitches or reputed snitches, and even drug addicts and homeless street people, elderly people, small children in wheelchairs, 
and women of all ages have fallen to this assassin's bullets as crime organization, in particular, La Liena, the dominant wing of the Juarez cartel, have ex expanded from drug trafficking <clears throat> into all manner <clears throat> of criminal activity. Young people have been the most victimized social group. The degree of extreme violence and torture, including decapitation and mutilations, defy the immigration. Some of the most extreme examples since 2008 include the following. 18 recovering drug addicts massacred by a death squad at a drug rehabilitation center in the colonial Colonia Bella Vista. 15 teenagers mistaken for gang members were gunned down in Colonial Villas de Salvacar. Several Juarez jur journalists in murdered, including legendary crime reporter Armando Rodriguez. Three people associated with the U.S. consulate assassinated. Thousands of quartered, duct taped, beheaded, burned, sexually mutilated, or otherwise de desecrated cadavers dumped in the streets. A car bomb killing a Juarez policeman and a respected paramedic. 149 policemen murdered in Juarez in 2010. 304 women murdered in 2010. Dozens of mass killings in bars, homes, drug rehab centers, private parties, shopping centers, restaurants, used car lots, junkyards, car repairs, and other business businesses and an estimated 20 percent of the homicides during the mexican drug war have occurred in juarez how do we explain this outrageous carnage beyond historical particulars and the intra and inter cartel wars five main social processes coincided in recent years to pr produce the unprecedented violence in juarez these processes each have differential timelines and cycles. They are not all unified and identical, but they have collectively produced the hyperviolence and lawlessness. First, the Ma Macadora modeled failed to produce economic mobility or social development for the majority of the border population. From the 1950s onward, primarily U.S. owned maquillas brought thousands of migrants to Juarez and consigned them to live in bar bones, bare bones neighborhoods, the colonias. The companies did not pay more than the substance wages <clears throat> and did not provide much training, nor did they construct schools, hospitals, or parks. In worker neighborhoods, the captive Makia worker population lived in these often squalid precarious conditions with little protection from the state or its employers. With the exception of the bus service that brought the factory workers in recycled yellow school buses to, ma to the manufacturing and assembly plants. Second, the global economic crisis closed many war as Makias and exported low wage jobs to China. The laid off borders workers were left with nothing to fall back on. As the U.S. Militish, I'm sorry, militianized its southern borders and with fences, walls, more border patrol agents, and a general crackdown on undocumented immigrants crossing into the United States to find work was no longer an option for most poor Warrenises. Crime became the main economic opportunity for unemployed youth. Third ongoing political problems in Mexico after a flawed transition of democracy brought the consolidation of free trade and neoliberal policies began begun in the 1980s. These policies abandoned the working class and poor who represent the vast majority of the Mexican population. In a time of reduced employment and wages, the corrupt corporate state controlled for 71 years by the Institutional Revolutionary Party, PRI, despite its myriad flaws, had at least provided a modicum of jobs, social safety net programs, and patronage. Moreover, the PRI's heavy-handed 
and corrupt rule limited the growth of drug cartels to a degree. In contrast, the neoliberal models championed by this since discredited President Carlos Salinas and continued by the new National Party, Action Party, PAN, administrations from 2000 onward removed much of the social safety net and broke down the old patronage networks that kept drug traffickers in line. Furthermore, Mexico's so-called democratic opening was mainly an opening for Mexican venture capitalists and international investors. Democracy neither improved the conditions of the poor nor allowed them more access to political decision making. After the defeat in 2006 of Andres Manuel, Manuel Lopez Obrador, the leftist strongest presidential candidate since Cauc, I'm sorry, Camac Cardenas, the progressive movement fragmented and lost much of the already scarce power it had over national affairs. The right wing pan and centrist PRI had control over the country, but their conflicts prevented creative political action and social programs that might have lessened the disaster already looming in Juarez. Bitter battles between the PRI and the PAN administration, administrations of Vicente Fox and Felipe Calderon allowed little or no cooperation between the federal government and state and local governments in Juarez and Chihuahua, state in when violence and crimin criminality began to spiral out of control, the thoroughly corrupt federal, state, and municipal police in Juarez viewed each other as enemies al allied with rival branches of organized crime. The chronically under underfunded criminality infested Juarez city government especially law enforcement, which in the best of times was a hindrance to the local population, became a scourge. Poorly planned judicial reform and the federally mandated military intervention only worsened an already dis <clears throat> desperate situation. In Juarez came crime paid and criminals were almost never caught or jailed. Fourth Cauldron's ill-conceived drug war, launched in 2006 and s sponsored and promoted by the U.S. government, became a disaster. Everywhere Cauldron sent military and federal police, the violence increased. In the states of Michoacan, Chihuahua, Sinaloa, Durango, and others, the bloody war was the same. Human rights violations and homicides, including the femicides, skyrocketed. Although rival cartels had been killing each other for years, Cauldron's improvised military mobilization threw gasoline on the fire and turned the, a problematic criminal situation into a virtual civil war. The U.S. government pushed Mexico to fight the drug war, and Mexicans were paying the price for it. As the U.S. executive branch now admits U.S. drug demand and tax gun laws fuel Mexican drug trafficking and related violence. Moreover, the success of U.S. law enforcement in closing Colombian and Caribbean drug corridors altered the transcontinental geography of the drug trade, creating a new main channel hemisphere. Drug shipments from South and Central America through Mexico and across the U.S.-Mexico border. And finally, the rise of the a counterculture of crime. In Mexico, beginning in the 1990s, emerged hand in hand with economic decline, political illeg Ill illegitimacy, and the de de decadence of law enforcement and the judicial system. The marginalized masses of unemployed and semi-employed workers, especially the youth who are ignored and isolated in a rigid class hierarchy, and now in a heavily consumer-oriented neoliberal Mexican society, became the shock troops for cartels, 
gangs and kidnapping and extortion rings. Organized crime, in fact, is propelled by unemployment and the hunger for consumer goods. Social mobility and the cosmopolitan lifestyle advertised in the omnipresent cyber electronic television imagery beamed to, beamed to a Mexican populace that has less and less means of obtaining them through legitimate means. Illegal operations flourish with little opposition and even cooperation from criminalized police forces. Mexico became a world leader in the kidnapping and extortion of legitimate businesses as organized crimes. Crime groups expanded into domestic drug sales, the undocumented immigration, immigrant trade, carjacking, kidnap, carjacking, kidnapping, extortion known as Colorado La Guida, prostitution and sales of pirated music, movies, and other goods. Organized crime groups began to conquer entire regions of Mexico <clears throat> and large parts of city like Juarez becoming quasi-state entities. Opponents of the mafia-like criminal expansion, whether pol politicians, journals, journalists, unbribable policemen, or activists were tortured and decapitated and their bullet-riddled bodies or body parts were hung from bridges and monuments were strewn in the streets. Cartels created a narco, spe narco spectacles of dumped, mutilated cadavers and large scale massacres in broad daylight to intimidate the general population. These horrific visceral displays were backed up by <clears throat> narco propaganda messages and threatening narco graffiti. Narco Montas Pro Cartel banned the attack. Rival cartel members and government officials and YouTube videos of interrogation and torture sessions, executions, and pro cartel manifestos. Simultaneously, drug traffickers celebrated their actions in upbeat narco corridors that espouse a gospel of brutality, drug abuse misogamy, money worship, and impunity. The counterculture of criminality became morbidly stylish and a kind of primitive ideological justification for anti-state, anti-social, and even nihilistic violence. Crime groups, including corrupt local, state, and federal police, engage engage in a feeding frenzy of murders designed to punish the real or perceived thieves of drug lords or informers purge the ranks of trailers traitors or disloyal members take revenge for previous killings exterminate business owners and would not pay a la cuita execute kidnap victims to destroy evidence or attack rivals or government agents that got in their way. The fragmentation and conflict among existing crime groups has produced multiple new crime organizations. The inability of the state and civil society to provide a viable appealing alternative to the counterculture of crime and violence means that it will come continue if not grow indefinitely. Many border people feel not only the victory and supremacy of one drug cartel in the city will reestablish a degree of order and peace. The discouraging scenario exists on, in one of the most important industrial cities in the Western Hemisphere. Located right on the U.S. border, it's evidence of the long-term bankruptcy of U.S. drug war policy neoliberal free trade agreements, and Mexican political leadership. In the face of all this, valiant Warrenese activists and pro protesters stage countless marches, demonstrations, vigils, and peace rallies. These courage, courageous actions are met with bloody represent, repre I'm sorry, repression, Politicians, empty promises, or silence from deaf 
and Dem government. As conflicted 2012 Mexican presidential election approaches, it is hard to envision any improvement. At the present, there is no end in sight to violence in Juarez. This is the end of the um, report in Mexico.